afternoon. And I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to our November 2011 Public Health Practice Grand Rounds. My name is Molly Mitchell, and I am the, um, manage the manager for the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And on behalf of the School of Public Health, as well as the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, I'd like to just welcome everyone to today's presentation on Maryland's Youth Suicide Prevention Program, A Caring Community Saves Lives. Um, for those of you who are watching online, I'd like to go ahead and encourage you to look at some of our other trainings that are on our website, including many of our archive trainings, as well as our training on public health nursing, and also alert you to some of our other face-to-face -face trainings that are coming up soon, including um, Managing Multiple Priorities on December 1st with Ray Perry, as well as Achieving Outcomes with Dr. Carolyn Fowler also on December 1st. And we have our next Grand Rounds coming up on an unusual date this month in December. It's going to be on December 7th. And that one is going to be on public health and the alcohol tax campaign, how Maryland beat the alcohol lobby and why it matters. Um, and I'd also like to encourage those of you who are watching online to please sign in so we can let our federal funders know who's watching and how many people are watching and also uh, encourage you to email questions for either of our presenters at any time during today's broadcast. We will have time at the end of the presentation for uh, Q&A. And with that, I'll go ahead and introduce both of our presenters for today. Um, we have Dr. Mary Swick, who received a BA in psychology and philosophy from Johns Hopkins University and a master's and PhD in child clinical psychology from Southern Illinois University. She completed a fellowship at Johns Hopkins in 2008, which she served as a site project coordinator and therapist for the treatment of adolescent suicide attempters. Dr. Swick joined the Center for American Indian Health in 2008 as an assistant scientist and has worked on three youth suicide prevention initiatives using community-based participatory research with the White Mountain Apache tribe. The first assessed risk and protective factors, treatment experiences, and preferences among youth who have attempted suicide. The second is an initiative to provide the community with a constellation of youth suicide prevention strategies. And the third evaluates the impact of two evidence-based interventions adapted by the tribe. Finally, she serves as the evaluator for the Maryland SAMHSA GLS grant. We also have as a presenter today Henry Westray, who is the State Administrator of the Maryland Suicide Prevention Program and the Director of the Garrett Lee Smith Grant with the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Mr. Westray is the former Chair of the Governor's Commission on Suicide Prevention here in Maryland. He has taught at numerous universities, including Morgan State University, Howard University, and the University of Lagos in Nigeria. He has his MSS from Bryn Mawr College and a bachelor's from Morgan State University and was also an intern in violence prevention at Harvard University. Mr. Westray was instrumental in the development of a crisis intervention program that would be available at any time, anywhere in the state. He put together a network of six agencies that make up the Maryland Youth Crisis Hotline. He's worked in to develop a state level interagency work group on youth suicide prevention, which brings together various state agencies to promote awareness and education and direct services. With that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Mr. Westray. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. It's really great to be here today and to welcome everybody and all of our online guests. Uh, it's my privilege to talk about Maryland's program. We feel we've done a lot over the years to prevent suicides in our states, and I'm glad to be here to share it with you today. Uh, in case you want information on me, the first slide just basically gives you my contact information. Uh, so if you need to write that down, you please feel free to do so. I'd like to start with a quote. Uh, the quote is, the best and most beautiful things in life cannot be seen or even heard. They must be felt with the heart. And it's by Hel the late Helen Keller, as you know, was deaf and, and blind. And my feeling, when you're working in this area, you really, particularly with people who have, are suicidal or who have families who've, who've had loved ones die from suicide, is important 
to, to use your heart and in connecting with them. Uh, with me today, as, as uh, was said earlier, would be Dr. Mary Swick, who's been working. Uh, she's with the Center for Indian, uh, American Indian Health uh, with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And uh, she has been our evaluator with our Garrett Lee Smith grant. I, I have a question for you. Um, how many people in here know somebody who's attempted suicide? Raise your hand. Okay, okay almost, it was such a large percentage of people in this group have had somebody who's attempted suicide. How many people know somebody who've completed suicide? Raise your hand. Wow. It's really amazing that in almost every group I go in, I'm surprised by the numbers of people whose suicide has touched their lives. Although you don't hear about it a lot, you know, you hear more about homicides. And as the data will show, that we have almost twice the number of suicides in our country than we do homicides. Okay, okay. 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 Uh, suicide is a complex. Complex. Uh, thanks for bringing that up anyway. But suicide is a complex issue which should be addressed with a public health approach that is comprehensive, culturally competent, and is based on best practices, practices which are evaluated. I wanted to give you some national data before we move forward. Uh, and, and actually, this just came out from the American Association of Suicidology. In 2000, and 2008 is the latest data we have. In 2008, there were over 36,000 suicides in this country. This represents one suicide every 15 minutes at a rate of 11.8 per 100,000. Uh, this means that in this presentation uh, of, of an hour and about and a half, we will have uh, six new suicides in this country. In 2007, there were 36, 34,000 suicides at a rate of 11.5 per 100,000. Again, when you look at the homicides, there were, there were over 18,000 homicides at a rate of 6.1 per 100,000. Again, you, you hear in the media and people are talking about the homicides, but we don't hear as much about the, so many suicides in this country that are taking place every day. And so we're here and we're hoping that we stimulate you to take more interest in this area and begin to do something about it. In 2008, an average of one elderly person, 65 and older, killed themselves every hour and 32 minutes. It's interesting to note in the 2000, I looked at some of the data from 2004 to 2008, uh, looking at the group that had the highest rates. And we I saw some changes. Um, I looked at in, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2004, 2006, 2007, and 2008, the age group which had the highest rate of suicide was from 45 to 54, which is a change. I don't know if this is a trend or what, but you know, I was kind of surprised to see that. Usually it's the elderly. Of all age groups, the elderly continue to have the highest rates. In 2008, there were 5,755 elderly suicides at a rate of 14.8 per 100,000. Of these deaths, uh, of all deaths, sorry, uh, suicide ranked number 10 among all deaths in this country. Anybody know what the number one uh, reason people die in this country from is from? Someone from the audience? You can just yell it out. Is it car accident? Oh, uh, no. Uh, at, actually, for youth, it is. But if we're talking about the total population, so you're correct in terms of youth, but in terms of the total population, what's the number one killer? Heart disease. Heart disease. Oh, great, great, great. Anybody know what the number two is? Uh, okay, good. Cancer. Okay, uh, suicide. Uh, I mean, homicide rated number 15 is number 15. Uh, Maryland ranked 46 among other states when you looked at the rates of suicide. Um, we generally are around 44th, and it's good to see that we have even gotten better on this rating of states to 46th. Uh, national youth, uh, youth data. In 2008, 
Suicide was the third leading cause of death for youth 15 to 24. Anybody know, we just said, uh, the number one cause of death for youth in this country? Somebody just said it over there? Accidents, exactly. Anybody know what the second leading cause of death would be for youth? Suicide. Uh, suicide is the third leading cause. Homicide. Homicide, exactly. It's homicide. So you have accidents, uh, homicides, and then suicides. Among youth aged 20 to 24, uh, 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 among youth, age, uh, the age youth 20 to 24 had the highest rate of suicide at 12.6 per 100,000. And uh, suicide consistently has been the second leading cause of death for college youth. Youth suicide rates increased more than 200% from, uh, from 1950s to the late 1970s, and from the 1970s to the mid-1990s, it remained pretty stable. From 19, what we saw in 19, um, I'm sorry, in 2007 and 2008, we saw slight increases. Public health burden. Family and friends of those who die, are, of course, are, are part of the, feel the burden of the loss of a loved one. And it's been estimated that for every one suicide, there are 25 people who are affected by that death. So there are many more people that are affected than even just the immediate family or the immediate friends. Each year, some 650,000 persons receive treatment in emergency rooms following an attempt. According to the CDC, 197,000 hospitalizations in this country due to uh, a suicide attempt. Major there's a major cost to the workforce and lost years of work productivity. Um, I'd like to bring up my colleague, uh, Dr. Mary Swick, who's going to talk about Maryland data. Thanks, Henry. So if you just give me a second, I'm going to pull up. I have a different set of slides here for you guys. Great, so I'm going to briefly go over some Maryland data that comes from national sources. And then the majority of my presentation is going to be data that we have access to from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner here in Maryland. And then lastly, I'm going to review some data from the SAMHSA grant that we have that Henry's going to talk a little bit more about after I present the data. So you'll get to hear a little more about the details of that grant. So um, many of you might be familiar with the National Violent Death Reporting System, and Maryland is one of 16 states that participates in that system. So here we just have some general data from the NVDRS here. And so I don't think any of this will be surprising um, to you. The one thing you'll note is the data is from 2008, and so some folks may wonder why don't we why we don't have more recent data. And unfortunately, that's a that's a lot of the nature of national suicide data is we're usually a few years behind in getting the data because they have to get it from different sources and verify and do different things. And so unfortunately, it takes a little while for, for it to get out here. Um, to be mindful of time, I'm just going to let you guys look at that for yourselves. So another piece of information we have about Maryland that comes from the American Association of Suicidology is by their calculations, we had 507 deaths in Maryland in 2008. That is total, that's not youth deaths, that's all ages. And Maryland is ranked 46th, as Henry said, in comparison to other states. So that means Maryland is doing well. Um, again, we, no deaths are acceptable, but um, in comparison to other states, um, we have lower numbers. And there you can see the annual suicide rates. I'm sure some of you like to see numbers in that way, is nine per 100,000. So um, one of the reasons I'm presenting this data from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner is this is part of the data that we have access to through Henry's position in the state and through the Samsa Garrett Lee Smith grant. It's very much um, 
to sort of real world data that we get from from the office of the chief medical examiner and you'll notice it's fairly basic data so a lot of it's demographic type information and that's because that's really what they have available um, so that's what you'll kind of see see next but we are able to have more recent data by going through the office of the chief medical examiner so here you can see we've got suicides in maryland for all ages from 2007 through 2010, just to give you a sense of total numbers in the state here. And so you can see one thing, and I've got a, see I've got a point with my mouse here, is that in 2009, there was an increase um, in the number of suicides. It, the rate um, and total numbers are usually fairly stable across years. There are some small fluctuations up and down, but there seemed to be a little bit of a larger increase in 2009 in Maryland. And we also are seeing that um, nationally. So when we talk to our colleagues from other states, they seem to be um, seeing that same thing. Does anyone have a guess in the audience as to maybe what happened around 2009 that might have led to an increase in suicides? Do they have an idea? Economic. Right, the economy. So the economy is what we don't know, but that's a very good um, hypothesis as to what, what may be going on there. But then you can see, so people wondered, well, would that trend stay in 2010? So 2010 looks like they're starting maybe to come, come back down again. So here again, and I'm going to end up focusing on youth, but I wanted to show a little bit of the all ages data. So you, here you can see the 2010 data, what's happening this past uh, year, complete year. And so here you can get a sense of the different age groups. So as Henry was saying, sort of the middle age years, 40 to 49 and 50 to 59, are really do have the highest numbers of suicides. However, um, you know, they have lots of other causes of death that are, that are causing older folks to die, whereas in youth, even though there's fewer number of deaths, youth in general don't die as much. So suicide is, like Henry said, the second and third leading causes of death in different ages of youth. Now here you can get a sense, I'm going to start to focus now on youth suicides in particular. And when we say youth, um, that can mean different things to different folks. And so we go through age 24. So considering young adults and college age students in that age group. So that's kind of important for you guys to keep in, in mind. And part of that um, has is related to the Garrett Lee Smith Fund. So the, those funds cover youth through ages 24 um, and, and just part of the developmental process. So here you can see again, this is the youth data by year, and you can see the youth data follows the adult data trend. So 2009, oops, I gotta look over here. We again had the most. Now some of you might like to see the numbers in rates as opposed to in just total numbers, which I've been showing you. And so here's a sense of what the rates were um, across youth. And so in 2008, just to give you guys a sense, the national rate for youth was 7.3. So that's the most recent data that we have. So here you can see Maryland's five. So we're lower than the national rate. Now here's a little bit of uh, the suicides broken down by age group. So as you can see here, and I think Henry alluded to this in his earlier slide, of youth, the majority of those who are dying from suicide are the young adult population. But um, you can see we do have youth as young as 10, um, and some years maybe younger than that, that die by suicide in our state and other states in the country, which is, which is pretty shocking. So again, this is just to give you a sense. Some people like to see a little bit of data over time. So the previous slide is over several years. And then you can see the more, the more recent year follows that trend. So again, you might wonder why we have the data grouped from 2007 to 2010. That might be a question that some of you are kind of wondering in your mind as we go through this. And part of it is this is very practice-oriented data. So I, um, it's not a research project, so I work with the state to help them analyze this data. And so they had done um, a large report that went through 2006 looking through the data. And so they more recently have asked us to look at the data from 2007 through 2010. So that's why the data is grouped that way, because I'm looking at this data kind of working in partnership with the state and as a service to them. So here you can see a little bit about what we have for gender. And not surprisingly, you can see that males account for the majority of suicides, and that follows national trend data. 
And you can see that holds true again for 2010. Here then we have some data by race and ethnicity in the state of Maryland. And so as you can see here, uh, white and African American youth are the most likely to die by suicide from what we know from the statistics. Um, we have seen over time in Maryland, and I think in other places, the percentages of, of African American youth who are dying by suicide seems to have been increasing over time. And it's hard to know whether that is true, that there's really a true increase, or if we're just getting better data, because um, as you can imagine, there can be a lot of stigma around reporting. Um, and so all of the suicide data we probably believe are underestimates. Um, and why do you guys think this data, all the data that we get might be underestimates for suicide? Anybody have any ideas? Yes. Well, there's a stigma. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, you could lose, like there, there's like insurance. And, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of thing, other things that are sort of mysterious deaths. You know, there's sort of car, single car accidents. Um, you know, there's, there's drug and alcohol overdoses that was it an accident or were they intentionally trying to take their lives? So there's a lot of messiness around this data. Um, but this, again, is what the Office of the Chief Med Medical Examiner, he, he determined the cause of death. But again, we would suspect that this is, this is underestimated. So again, you can see the trend kind of holded for 2010. There weren't any really changes there. So we get, th things get a little more interesting. I know this data, you know, it's, it's pretty basic, but things get a little more interesting when you start to look at sort of the method of how youth are dying from suicide. And here you can see um, that from 2007 to 2010, hanging was the most common method, um, and second was firearms. Then you can kind of see a, a sort of a miscellaneous list after that. Um, and so one of the things, if we think from a public health approach, um, what is one of the common approaches is means restriction. I hope hopefully folks in the room kind of know what that is. So for example, you know, firearms is a major cause of death. Let's limit youth's access to firearms, and then hopefully there'll be less deaths. Or if, you know, youth are jumping off bridges, let's put up barriers so that restricts that means for them. So what makes it tricky with if hanging's your most common means how, would means restriction work so well? What do people think in the room? I see people shaking their heads no, right? Because you can get access to, to that any which kind of way, um, unfortunately. So that does, that kind of makes that, that method of suicide prevention tricky given this, this data. So that informs us a little bit here. Um, one thing I wanted to show you, because I thought it was uh, a little interesting, even though it's all ages, if you look at suicides by method and look at the different age groups, you notice there are some differences. So if people can look at the slide, what do folks um, sort of notice about this slide? Because it differs by age. Yes, older people are using guns and younger people people are using hanging. So that's, that's, that's interesting, and you, you might kind of wonder sort of why that is. It might be access. You know, there could be lots of different reasons. Um, so just to give you a sense, because I know you're probably thinking, well, gosh, we're just looking at data from 2007 to 2010 or 2010, but what's kind of been happening over time in Maryland? So this gives you a sense from year 2000, so this decade, basically, of what's been happening. And you can see that there is some fluctuation in the total number of suicides, but, you know, it's not, there are not large fluctuations. And there was, there's kind of this decrease here in 2008, and like we've noticed, there was this kind of increase again in 2009. Um, you know, and one of the things that, that is really talked about now in sort of the suicide research literature and those who are really trying to affect change is nationally in Maryland, over all you know, the years that we've been suicide, uh, doing suicide prevention, it's really hard to change this rate. There's lots of things that people are doing. There's some small changes, but we haven't really found a way yet. And so if any of you are interested in pursuing this as a field, there's lots of room for improvement because we haven't figured out the way to really change this rate. I think we're doing lots of good work and, and all our efforts are helping kids um, and adults, but for some reason it's not getting reflected in this rate. So that's a challenge, I guess, to those of you in the audience and those of you at home um, as to how we can kind of do that. 
This is something else that I thought was sort of interesting over time to share with you, because I know some of the other data um, is more basic, is this is some changes in the method over time. So what do folks uh, in the audience here notice about that? Yeah, so it did, in the past, it was firearms, right? Exactly. Um, and so one might wonder what brought about that change. Do people have, might have any guesses as to what that might be? Do the corresponding data also show that it's more youths that are committing suicide in the last two years? Well, this, da this data for the, for the change in method is just youth suicides right here. This is all just oh, youth. Right. That's it, yeah. yeah, that's OK. So that, that would, be, would have been a good idea. So you guys may not be aware of this, but around this time in Maryland, around the time when the change occurred, there have been some um, increases in gun legislation and trying to make it harder to get access to guns. Now, do we know if that's the direct cause? No, but that's one hypothesis as to maybe why this change is occurring. And we um, we see this nationally, um, and I even see this on the reservation that I that I work um, work in. So um, a little bit of data, and I'll try to go through this quickly because I want to make sure Henry, he's going to talk about this grant. Um, so one of the things that Henry's going to talk about is I don't know how many of you are familiar with gatekeeper trainings. Um, so Henry will talk about what that is. But these are basically uh, training models to train people in the community who come into a lot of contact with youth to identify youth at risk for suicide and refer them for services. So it might be the bus drivers, the nurses, the teachers, to make them aware of warning signs for suicide so that they can notice it in youth and get them connected to care. So there's different uh, types of programs, and Henry might talk about those. But in Maryland, this just kind of gives you a sense of a little bit about what's occurring there. So we give folks who participate in these trainings some uh, exit surveys about how they liked the trainings and how many participated. So here you can see through the SAMHSA funding that Henry is going to talk about, in Maryland, we've had 117 of these gatekeeper trainings as a result of this grant. And we've had over 4,500 folks trained for youth. So you would say, that's a, that's a lot. And so we would have hopefully expect some uh, changes from that. Just to give you a sense of the demographics of those who are trained in Maryland to be gatekeepers, um, it's not surprising that the large percentage are female. And you can see there they're middle-aged and Caucasian. Um, so we're, a lot of our trainings are occurring in the school setting. So as you can imagine, that might uh, represent the demographics of teachers and other school staff. So that's not so surprising. Um, and you can see here that education is the number one uh, setting that we're training folks. So in terms of outcomes of training, so this is a Likert scale question. You know, it's just a basic training survey. And so you can see here um, that it's a five-point scale, so people are kind of falling in the middle there, which is not really uh, surprising when we give Likert-type scales. Often folks fall in the middle with training satisfaction. We usually find something beneficial from trainings we go to. We wish they would have done some things better. but um, So that's kind of Maryland's kind of falling in the middle. This, this compares with the national data. Um, and this questionnaire is given to all um, folks across the country who have SAMHSA Garrett Lee Smith uh, money. So we didn't design this questionnaire here at Hopkins or Henry at the state didn't design it as part of this grant program. Then you can see here, I think this is my last, um, let me double check, yeah, my last slide, is that one of the other things we're trying to do, so it's one thing to be satisfied with the training you're receiving, right? I mean, that's one thing. But the goal of the training is to identify youth and get them connected to services. So this data is what we're trying to start to look at to see if that's really happening in, across the country and in Maryland. So you can see here that the first column is the national data that we have from the SAMHSA grant. So there's 73 sites represented there. And then you can see in Maryland, at this time, we have four sites data represented. And four sites are basically four different counties is the way to think about it. Um, because there are a lot of challenges to collecting this data in a school setting. But you can see here that the majority of youth who are identified at risk are referred to mental health services. So you can see about 83% nationally and 95% Maryland. And then you can see of those youth how many are receiving mental health services. And again, it's a large proportion. 
Um, one of the other things that you can see that's interesting in Maryland is that a lot of youth are also being referred to other types of services besides mental health. So this might be, you know, if they have a team of teachers at the school that follows, you know, youth that are having trouble, they're referred to that team, or maybe they're referred to tutoring or other kinds of services. Now, the last number is what you might see is youth who received follow-up. Does anything strike folks about that number um, for Maryland? slow compared to the, what we know from the national data. Now, one of the things here we have to have a caveat, we only have four sites, right? So we don't, we can't expect that to be representative data. So part of what we're learning by working with the schools as, as researchers is that not all schools gather this data, interestingly. And so now with our talks with the state, because we've shown them this data, they've said, oh, wow, that's because we're not really collecting it. We don't have a system in place, and maybe we should be gathering that follow-up data. So they're trying, actually. So this data is informing the state to then say, let's maybe actually have an, um, a statewide data collection and encourage all the schools to report follow-up data. Because you can imagine, if you have a youth identified at risk for suicide in your school, um, for lots of good, lots of reasons, whether it's from a lawsuit perspective, ethical reasons, just providing good care to your students, you'd want to ensure that there's some consistent follow-up there. Um, so again, I'm going to stop here, and I know that Henry's going to come back and talk a little bit more about the program, and there's time for questions at the end, because I know people may have questions about the data. So I'm going to take my slides down for Henry here. Oh, there you go, Henry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. I'm left-handed, so I have to put it on the mouse on the other side. Okay, uh, I thought I'd show, uh, we have a Maryland quilt of, of many uh, those who have been, who have uh, completed suicide in our state. And this was done by an organization called SPEAK, uh, Suicide Prevention Educational Awareness for Kids, who have been real advocates in our state for suicide prevention. They've done a lot of training and have gotten a lot of legislation, uh, which I'm gonna talk about uh, in this presentation, passed uh, in, to help with this issue. Uh, there was an, uh, our program is really driven by those who have lost uh, loved ones to suicide. And the first organization we had in Maryland uh, that was a group of parents, many of whom had lost their kids to suicide, was a group called MAZE, Marylanders Against Youth Suicide. Uh, they uh, were instrumental in uh, encouraging the state to do more about this, this issue, as well as, uh, anyone knows Susan White Bowden? She was a... Yeah, she was a real advocate in this area. She was a member of Mays, and she was a friend of the governor as well, so which that helped as well. Her husband and her son committed suicide, and she's written several books on her journey to healing uh, after those suicides. But she was also very instrumental in terms of getting uh, legislators to get involved and getting the state involved and in, in setting up something to address suicide in the state of Maryland, youth suicide. In, 19, in 1986, the Senate Joint Resolution Number 7 requested that the governor establish a task force on youth suicide prevention. That same year, House Bill 1221 was passed, which established youth suicide prevention uh, school programs. Other uh, governor proclamations in 1987, Youth Suicide Prevention Week was established in Maryland. And in 1990, the Maryland Youth Crisis Hotline Day was uh, proclaimed by the governor. In 1991, October was established as Youth Suicide Prevention Month in Maryland for the first time. Uh, that was a time we felt that everybody can look at this issue. We can do a lot of PR and reach the media so they can reach youth. We did a lot of radio and television at the time. Uh, we had all kinds of contests in school. We had one promotion in school where we had kids draw hotline cards and one won uh, the competition, and we, we used that hotline card uh, to go out to all over the state of Maryland. The Maryland model has focused on uh, youth 24 years of age and younger, and we looked at prevention, intervention, and postvention. Uh, anybody know what postvention is? Anybody know what postvention is? Like Say that again? Yeah, it's kind of close, but it's, it's after a suicide. 
Uh, it's an important. Anybody here know what a cluster suicide is? Okay, uh, cluster suicide is one, uh, two or more related suicides. And we see this among young people. So it's important after there's a completed suicide to have interventions with family and friends and getting good information out to the public so to prevent others from completing suicide. Okay, uh, so we try to, also we've just done a uh, grid of postvention services uh, in our state uh, nationally as well. And that grid is on the governor's uh, website of the Governor's Commission on Suicide Prevention it's website. When, I'll give you that information later so you can always look that up. We also look at mental, in these three areas, we look at mental health community and cultural factors as well. The Maryland model. Uh, July 1987, the Governor's Task Force issued a report called For a Better Tomorrow, For Better Tomorrow a plan for youth suicide prevention in Maryland. Uh, this report outlined a comprehensive strategy to reduce youth suicides in our state. In 1990, the, governor's task for, uh, the governor asked the Mental Hygiene Administration to hire an administrator, which was me, uh, to, <laughs> to, to uh, lead the charge for suicide prevention and developing, uh, implementing the recommendations of the task force. Uh, the task force also asked for a council uh, governor's Council on Suicide Prevention, but the governor decided he wanted to set up uh, an interagency work group as well to work with uh, the state designated person, which is myself, and I chaired that governor's interagency work group. Uh, this is a report for Better Tomorrow, and then in 1999, we saw the Surgeon General's re Call for Action report, and I was a part of that group that developed this plan, uh, the Call for Action report as well. Uh, the governor's interagency work group on youth suicide prevention, uh, it included the Mental Hygiene Administration, the Maryland State Department of Education, the Department of Human Resources, the uh, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Administration, and the Office of Chief Medical Examiners, and last it was the Department of Juvenile Justice. And there were several committees under the auspices of the work group. They included the Hotline Committee, the Conference Committee, the At-Risk Populations Committee, the Research Committee, the PR Committee, the School Health Committee, and the Task Force to Prevent Suicide Prevention and Juvenile Justice, which I uh, chaired. Um, one of our major components of our program at the time was developing a the first decentralized hotline uh, for youth. Uh, that was the Maryland Youth Crisis Hotline. It was the first time by the decentralized, I mean, uh, this was the first time an 800 number had been decentralized such that you call that one 800 number and we have several centers that are connected around the state. And where, when you call, the caller will get the senators closest to where they're calling. So that was the first time that had been done. Uh, uh, there's a national lifeline now. Uh, it's 1-800-273-TALK, which was based on the Maryland model. Again, it was the first decentralized hotline for youth in the country. A service began uh, August in 1990, and actually I eat, I meet with, uh, we all eat together as well a lot. <laughs> we do a lot of food in our meetings. Um, since 1990, we've been meeting monthly, so all of these hotlines that are part of the network uh, continue to meet and to coordinate services. Uh, they have immediate 24-7 crises intervention, information referral, and community outreach. Uh, we know that oftentimes when, when people call hotlines, uh, they have feelings of wanting to die and feelings of wanting to, to be saved at the same time. And we feel that if, if the hotline was there, someone for them to talk to, that you know, they can, we can convince them that their lives are important and save their lives. So uh, that's the reason we were so excited about getting this service up. It was a state of the art back then. We'll talk about what we're doing later, no, doing now later in this presentation. Uh, MHA and six local crisis centers were part of the network, and this is how the network looked across the state. Uh, you had the Frederick County Hotline. Uh, you had the uh, Grassroots Hotline, which is in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, you had the Montgomery County Hotline, the Prince George's County Hotline. You had Walden, B B uh, Sierra, which was in St. Mary's County, and the Life Crisis Hotline. We now have the Baltimore Crisis Response, which is a part of our network, although they're not directly on the line. Uh, Walden Sierra is no longer part of our network, uh, 
but uh, we do have the Baltimore crisis response who's kind of taking their place. Uh, these are again uh, the whole network. Uh, uh, we are, uh, at that time we also had the uh, University of Maryland working with us who did a lot of the data related to this service. Uh, the Center for Substance Abuse Research did a lot of our data. These are some of the PR things we've di we did. Uh, that's uh, Sam Horn of the Orioles. We did a campaign uh, with PSAs with the Orioles. And uh, that's me, believe it or not. Um, if you work in this area long enough, you lose your hair. It's, it's a fact, it's a, it's a fact. But um, uh, we, de we developed a whole lot of brochures and a lot of stuff that, we went, that went out to the community. Um, this is the uh, report that the Maryland Youth Suicide Prevention School Program, the first report that they did on school programs. And there was a school health committee and what the charge of that committee was to increase the awareness among school personnel and community leaders to train school personnel, develop and implement school-based preventive programs and pilot programs, facilitate cooperative agency efforts to utilize community resources in the development and implementation of teen suicide prevention programs. Prevention, uh, three components of the program were prevention, intervention, and postvention. We also had the Maryland Task Force on, Youth, on Suicide Prevention and Juvenile Justice. Uh, now it's called the uh, Juvenile Services Administration. Uh, back then it was called the Juvenile Justice Administration. We had had uh, several uh, young people who, this came about when several young people had attempted suicide who were in juvenile justice facilities. So we decided that we needed to look at this area and begin to do something about it. Uh, we had a 12 member uh, task force uh, that started in 2000. Uh, and the goal was to improve suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention policies, procedures, services, and training in juvenile justice, review the problems of attempts and completions, examine policies and procedures in Maryland and in other states, review national literature on suicide prevention in prisons and juvenile justice facilities. And we also wanted to look at any model programs that were out there. We also consulted with national experts in this area, and we brought one national expert in to speak at our annual conference. Uh, we also were charged with finding funding, funding and develop training modules. Uh, one of the unique modules we developed with the Maryland Youth Crisis Highline Network, at that time there weren't a lot of models out there in terms of training people in this area. And so we developed them ourselves and we had the Maryland, we had the Hotline Network train juvenile justice personnel. Um, we, we found some funds from juvenile justice themselves who paid for this training. And so uh, we had the Hotline staff. Oftentimes what we find is Hotlines are the, are the ones who've been, have had a lot of training in suicide prevention. When you, when you look in any state, when you have Hotlines, a lot of people, you have uh, hotlines that address uh, this issue, and they oftentimes are trained and certified by the American Association of Suicidology. So we wanted to make sure we use this hotline network in terms of our training here in Maryland. A uh, final put, report on this task force was issued in August 22nd in 2001. Most recommendations became a part of the DJJ's Secretary's Directive uh, in 2004, I'm sorry, 2000, I'm sorry, December Fourth, two 2001. Um, we do an annual conference every year, and this is one of our first. Uh, that was my co-chair, uh, Chris McKee, who was with the Mental Health Association. And uh, that happened to be Jade Smalls, who was the first run up to Miss America. Uh, it's a long story. We had uh, her, her platform was suicide prevention, and I happened to meet her at a, at a, at a conference I was organizing in uh, New York with the National Organization for People of Color Against Suicide. And she was gracious enough to come to our state and to work with us. Uh, these are some of the brochures from our conference. Now we have online registration, of course. We're modern now. Uh, I do want to put a commercial in <laughs> at this point. Uh, we're having our 24th annual Suicide Prevention Conference. Uh, this conference is the oldest as well as the largest state suicide prevention conference in the country. And we're very proud of it. Uh, we just finished it in October. Uh, our next conference will be October 3rd, 2012. And if you want to be on our list, please email me and I'll put you on our mailing list to invite you to the conference. 
I wanted to talk about uh, a report, uh, linkages of life uh, to life, uh, the Maryland plan uh, for suicide prevention. Uh, we thought it was time to update the task force report that was done in 1980, 80, in the 1987 and decided to, that we need to bring a, a group of people together. And we had something like 44 members from various, uh, from various uh, organizations and various uh, state and local agencies to come together to, to update the Maryland plan. And that's what we did between 2000, uh, it was to focus on uh, 2008 to 2012. I chaired that committee. Um, and the goal was awareness, intervention, methodology, and postvention. And it proposes to establish an Office of Suicide Prevention within the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Administration. Uh, we didn't get an office, but I'll talk about uh, what we have gotten so far and one day we hoped to be able to get an office on suicide prevention in state government. Develop a more coordinated prevention, intervention, and postvention uh, services across the state to include youth and young adults, including high-risk uh, youth returning war veterans and their families. Address core components of youth suicide prevention programs by local school, systems and other educational networks, increase funding for youth suicide prevention and postvention, including increased funding to the Maryland Youth Crisis Hotline and building capacity of that network. Uh, we wanted to develop an, a website and new technologies to address and help youth. We wanted to infuse cultural competence throughout uh, services for youth as well, and to develop a youth suicide prevention plan in each child serving agency. Okay, it will land somewhere. <laughs> Increase in service training to local departments of correction and youth detained in local jails. One of the interesting things we found in juvenile justice uh, across the country was that we thought there were going to be many more suicides among youth who are incarcerated in, in these facilities. Uh, and we found that the, it wasn't a high rate of completions. And uh, some of the experts were saying this was due to the fact that they had such a structured program, they were always with somebody, generally, as opposed to the high rates of suicides in jails, uh, where there's no structured program, uh, a real structured program, as we see in juvenile justice facilities. Uh, we want to strengthen state's capacity to respond to crises and to serve at-risk youth in need, increase the number and quality of trainers in youth suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention, increase outreach in the number of trainings to gatekeepers and public, and to the public around youth suicide prevention issues, and work with the faith uh, faith community around uh, around youth suicide prevention. Uh, implement a model for hospital urgent care suicide, uh, similar to what uh, there's a program called the post care follow up program for at risk youth communities. What we found is one state had, uh, uh, when per a person came to uh, enter an uh, emergency room uh, because they had attempted suicide, uh, when they left the emergency room, uh, they were sent a postcard several weeks after they, admit, they had been admitted. And when they found that there was an effect, just sending a postcard, it was a very simple thing to do, it didn't cost a lot, but they found it was a you know, really good result. So we were considering that program for our state as well. Uh, we wanted to establish a baseline listing of existing support systems for survivors and attempters. And we wanted to do this with, all, with no money. And then we were fortunate in 2008 that Maryland was granted a $1.5 million Garrett Lee Smith grant. Uh, and uh, Mary talked about some of the uh, data from this grant early, and I'll, I'll talk about some of it as well. But we were very excited to, to be able to get, finally get some money to do some things. Um, uh, funding has been provided. Uh, to five cohorts of states, tribes, and college campuses to implement suicide prevention activities. Maryland was cohort four. Uh, we developed a grant advisory team, and that consisted of representatives from MHA, MSDE, uh, Hopkins, University of Maryland, 
And the goals of the, of the, pro, of the grant was to strengthen local school programs to help high-risk high counties to establish an array of community-based programs, train gatekeepers um, to fund organizations who are working with at-risk youth. Uh, Al, Dr. Al Zaychuk, uh, who's at the Mental Hygiene Administration, was our principal investigator. I was the project director. I am the project director. Uh, Megan Crosby Buttinger is the from Hopkins is a project manager and done a wonderful job. And we, of course, our evaluator uh, uh, was as Dr. Mary Swick. And we have as a research assistant Allison Dobb, who's with us today. Allison is Megan here as well. Oh, Megan. Uh, I just have to say the partnership with Hopkins has been phenomenal. And, you know, I just encourage other states to, when they ask me about the Garrett Lee Smith grant, to please partner with a university and, you know, provides that research element that and data that's so, so needed. Okay, um, in terms of funding uh, grantees, our sub awards. Uh, we had first started, we had level one grants, which were school-based grants, and we had 18 sub-awards in this area. Uh, our level two grants were high-risk uh, counties, and these were counties we saw that may be high-risk in terms of high rates or high-risk because of high numbers, because some of these counties are small, they didn't, their rates weren't based on 100,000 population, which kind of skewed the numbers. So we decided that we're going to not only try to fund the counties that had high rates, but to have high numbers in actuality. So we uh, funded three sub-awards sub in this area. Uh, level three grants were community-based grants, and we had three sub-awards in this area. We also uh, had special population awards to two sub-awardees and specialized projects for two sub-awardees as well. Level one uh, grants, we had 18 sub-awardees. Uh, in terms of, uh, we, we just kind of, almost every county got some kind of award in our state. Allegheny County, Anne Arundel County, Calvert County, Caroline County, Carroll County, Cecil County, Charles County, <laughs> Dorchester County, Frederick County, Garrett County, Harford County, Howard County, Kent County, Anne Arundel, uh, Queen Anne's County, sorry, uh, Somerset County, Talbot County, Washington County, and Wacomico counties. On level two, we, where we had three sub-awardees, a level two grants. Uh, we had Anne Arundel County and Prince George's County. Uh, last was Queen, An Queen Anne's County. Level three awardees were community-based grants. Uh, we had three, Frederick County, Prince George's County, and Wooster County. Uh, for sp special populations, we had two awards. And we, we knew there were organizations out there that are working with special populations. Um, and we. So we wanted to fund some of these organizations and help them do their work better, and wanted them to be part of our program as well. And we fund, we gave some funding to the National Organization for People of Color Against Suicide, uh, better known as NOPCAS. And they do outreach across the country to uh, communities of color in, in, in this country. Uh, also, we wanted to, we were seeing, and actually some new research out that shows a high rate of attempts among gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender uh, youth in particular. So we wanted to, to target this population for a special funding, and we were able to give some grant, a grant to the Gay Community Center of Baltimore. Uh, other specialized projects uh, were in Worcester County Department uh, of Health. Uh, we they did some funding. We funded them to do some funding. Uh, some I'm sorry, some outreach to college-age youth, and the Maryland Youth Crisis Hotline. We started something called the Maryland Youth Crisis Hotline chat line, which started October 17th of this year. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little later. Uh, this is a slide that Mary had earlier. Uh, when we talk about the various models uh, that we have available, these are various programs that have been developed uh, that uh, different states have been using across the country in terms of helping people uh, address the issue of suicide prevention. And question, persuasion, and prefer is, is really the primary model that we're seeing across the country and in Maryland. We have 13 grantees who use this model. Uh, this is a, a, a shorter, uh, when you, when you, uh, it's 
to use this model, it's, it's a shorter time in which we, we have to train people, as well as when you train a trainer, it's only one day, uh, as opposed to applied suicide intervention skills model, or ASSIST, which it, it takes a week to train a trainer and is, is rather expensive compared to QPR. And um, it's a two-day training for, for non-trainer training so that's to the general public. So we had seven people use the applied suicide intervention skills model or assist model. Uh, what we did when we first started our uh, grant, we provided the state organized, we brought the QPR people in to do training uh, for uh, people who were interested in being train, uh, trainers of uh, using this model. And we brought the applied suicide intervention skills people in, uh, which, are, which are living works really out of Canada and to train the trainers uh, in this model. What we saw is that because of cost as well as time, because a lot of schools didn't want to send their, their staff away for two days, <laughs> for two-day training, which the applied suicide prevention uh, model requires, we saw that more, more sub-grantees were uh, going to the QPR model. Not that it's a bad model, but we thought the uh, applied suicide prevention model is a really phenomenal model as well. And so what we did is we gave some scholarships. I think we provided 17 scholarships to people uh, so we can get additional people doing this training around our state. As well as we, ha uh, we had had before the, uh, uh, the Garrett Lee Smith grant, we had had uh, representatives from our hotlines trained as well as myself trained in this model, as well as in the QPR model. Uh, the yellow ribbon uh, model, we had five grantees use this model, sub-grantees, and uh, a safe talk model, which is again by Living Works, which is a shorter model as well. Uh, we had four grantees use this model. Um, I think Mary went through some of this. Uh, again, we had 3,683 people trained in the QPR model. The ASSIST model, we had 184 people. Uh, the Safe Talk, we had 230, and Yellow Ribbon, 490. Uh, there may be actually more people trained in this uh, Yellow Ribbon, but we used the Survey Mon Monkey to, to gather data, uh, not our traditional um, uh, uh, surveys that were used uh, uh, from, a, from the federal government. Uh, the uh, Yellow Ribbon, um, so we had a total of 4,587 uh, trainees. Mary did go through the slide, so I will not go uh, talk about the demographic characteristics again. It was uh, predominantly female. The race was predominantly uh, white. I was kind of surprised at the age at 43. The average age was 43. OK. We have some old people out there. <laughs> No, 43 is not old. Okay, but I was kind of surprised. I thought we, uh, they were they would, they would be a bit younger. Uh, these are some of the work settings uh, that people, uh, not surprisingly, uh, that uh, we trained people were from. Uh, not surprisingly, 88.4 percent were from education. Um, this is Ginkgo News. Uh, Ginkgo News is a, a, a quarterly newsletter that Megan uh, from Hopkins and the staff, actually we all kind of work on it together, but they kind of spearheaded this uh, wonderful newsletter uh, that comes out quarterly. And our online chat, uh, if you call, if you uh, go to www.facebook.com slash help for Maryland youth, or to www.helpformarylandyouth.org, uh, you can chat. You can chat with someone, which is part of our, which are part of our Maryland Youth Crisis Hotline Network, 24 hours a day. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's the hotline is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But the chat service is from four to nine, uh, Monday through Friday. I did want to say a few words about uh, suicide prevention, education awareness for kids. This is one of the organizations that really have been working with Maryland. Uh, Lisa Covington is on your far right, who's the president of this organization. And they have been really instrumental in terms of helping the state move forward. 
uh, and, and uh, do a lot in this area. One of the one of the projects they really helped. We were, for years we have been trying to get uh, phones on bridges. Uh, we were finding that uh, in our state people were jumping from the bridges, and particularly the Bay Bridge. And what we would see them do is they would pace. They would go to the center of the bridge and then kind of pace, and then they would jump over the bridge. And we thought that if we put some hotlines up there that you know while they're pacing maybe this they'll see one a number that they can call to talk to somebody so we uh, were instrumental in getting those phones on those bridges and on several straight state bridges uh, with the help of, of of speak in 2009 the governor signed the executive order to establish the commission on suicide prevention and this year he signed that same year he signed uh, bill, House Bill 973, promoting the youth crisis hotline in schools. We wanted to make sure that every young person knew of that number. Uh, the Governor's Commission on Suicide Prevention, and here's the website address in case you want to go. A lot of the data we've gone over today is on that website. I'd like to end with a quote. Sometimes our light goes out, but it's blown into flame by another human being. Each of us owes deepest thanks to those who have rekindled, rekindled this light. And I'd like to thank all of you who have worked so very hard to rekindle the spirits making Marylanders, Marylanders a caring community that saves lives. Thank you very much. And we're here for uh, questions and answers. Uh, we will, hopefully we'll give you answers as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, to both of our presenters. Um, and now is the part of our presentation where we do have time for questions and answers. And for those of you who are joining us online, you can simply um, click on that link on your screen and uh, send us an email question. And in the meantime, um, the floor is open for any questions we have from our live audience for either of our presenters. Um, I have a question that I can get started with. Um, when you were talking about uh, some of the youth suicide prevention models, I was thinking about a program that I've heard of nationally in which um, they reach out to gay teenagers um, called, I think it's um, It Gets Better. And it's different um, college students as well as celebrities who um, kind of give these videotaped messages to teenagers in high school who may be gay, lesbian, transgendered, letting them know that it does get better. And I'm wondering if you have any connection to that or can speak to the efficacy. Yeah, um, we, we have a connection to the Trevor Project, uh, which uh, the Prince George's County actually hotline, which is part of a hotline network, answers a Trevor line in the evenings nationally. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, as part of our grant, we wanted to do outreach for the, the gay, lesbian, uh, transgender bisexual community. Uh, actually, we we did the, a forum with Mayor Smoke. I mean, you know how many years ago that, that was. How, <laughs> Mayor, Mayor Smoke was here in what the uh, 80s. <laughs> okay, so we did the first gay youth forum where uh, we had uh, Mayor Smoke as well as many other city officials in Baltimore. We had gay youth from all over the state come to talk about their issues to uh, the mayor as well as we've worked with the Gay Community Center in terms of uh, offering trainings and you know, access to resources uh, of, uh, that we have. Great, mm -hmm. okay. Um, is that a question over here? Um, so I'm curious if uh, income level and uh, geography uh, proved a risk factor. I wasn't here for the first five minutes, so sorry if, if you covered that, I missed it, but uh, that was my question. Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I think we have better data nationally in terms of geographic location. So um, in terms of suicide, you do tend to see states that are in the west um, having higher suicide rates and states on the east coast having lower suicide rates. You also tend to see states that have higher rural populations or that are more kind of spread out um, of time, having higher suicide rates. Um, in addition, one population that's extremely at high risk is Native American uh, reservations. 
Um, so I don't know if that answers your questions in terms of geography, but you do see differences um, there. It looks like you might have a follow-up sure. thought the, to that. Is, sure. Is the, is the city um, ever a risk factor, in a, whether you're looking at Maryland or anywhere? The thing with the, the cities is usually the cities have higher populations. Sure. So they have higher numbers because there's a larger number of folks living in cities. But if you look at the rates, their rates generally are lower because it tends to be more of these rural, low SES populations that do seem to be more at risk. So we do also see SES as a risk factor, but I think one of the important points, um, and I think you know, you know, you from your own experience will probably know this, is that suicide affects everyone. So you can be someone who is very affluent, a celebrity, you can be someone that doesn't have a lot of money. So even though we might see um, low SES as a risk factor, um, really suicide can touch and affect sort of everyone, city or not. And so I think that's one of the big messages that people sort of, there's the data that tells us these different risk factors, but if you look at all the risk factors, any of us in the room could be at risk, probably, right? I mean, there's so many different things um, that are risk factors for suicide. There's not like one, we haven't found like one or two things that are the risk factors. So it's, so it's kind of tricky there. Um, so there's sort of two messages, and I don't know if you have a follow-up thought to that. Yeah, uh, is there a is it weather, weather or season also a risk factor? We do see some of that, yeah. So we do see some seasonality uh, to, to that. And so some people might, you know, I don't know if people in the room might have guesses. So there's, there's sort of like a folklore that maybe around the holidays, and there's been some conflicting data, which is tricky too. So there's been some data that says, yes, maybe there is some seasonality to suicide, maybe winters and other times, but then, there, but then there's been some that have shown, well, the holidays aren't necessarily a time of high risk because people usually do get connected with folks kind of around the holidays. Like if you're not generally connected, holidays are a time you might. So there's, um, that's one of the things is that suicide research is compared to a lot of other fields in sort of mental, mental health and public health, it is actually fairly new. So there's a lot of information on risk factors, but we do sometimes get conflicting information. So sometimes different research studies show different things, which makes it really um, challenging. So for those of you in the room that are students, which I'm guessing a lot of you are, it's a, it's a very, um, it could be a very rewarding and interesting area to get into because we are still learning. We, we do know some things, but we're still learning a lot. Yeah, I'm glad Mary did say that, um, that we're all at risk and uh, people who, uh, as we see the economy get worse and people lose their jobs and losing their homes, uh, they never thought of themselves as being at risk for suicide. You know, they didn't meet any of the traditional risk factors, and, uh, but they're killing themselves. So, you know, risk factors may change over time, as well as um, if you go to the Governor's Commission website, it will give you an analysis of some of those webs, uh, if you look on the, in that website. We did put uh, analysis of risk factors. Uh, a lot of the research say the number one risk is a previous attempt. You know, if you've already, it's something about rehearsing it that make you more apt to complete it. One follow-up though that you might find kind of interesting, it, it depends too on the population you're working with, as you, as you might imagine. So the risk factors in, that I, um, among the tribes that I work with in mm -hmm. the Southwest can look very different than the risk factors maybe for youth who are in you know, Baltimore City. So that's why it gets really tricky. So something interesting in the reservation that we have found around seasonality, just to kind of give you something, is that we actually find that most youth on the reservation die um, in the summertime which might be different than you might, because a lot of times people think like the winter or the holidays are high risk, just kind of if you, if you kind of would guess. Do anybody in the audience have a guess as to why that might be on a reservation community, why the summertime could be a high risk time for youth, or in any community really? Yeah, they have a lot more free time. There's low structure, low supervision. We know that on the reservations and, and among youth in general, alcohol is a big risk factor for suicide. Alcohol use, a lot of it is involved in a lot. And so there, that's a very high use time and they're not getting a lot of monitoring. So there for us, that's when we actually sort of see a lot. And, and on the reservation too, and these patterns can change over time. We actually also see a lot around, a lot of attempts um, around Valentine's Day. So people might have thoughts about why that mm -hmm. is. We know that for young people, one of the reasons they often list for why they've attempted suicide is um, you know, interpersonal conflict, break up with boyfriends and girlfriends. So that's something that we kind of see in some of that data that I have access to. So that just might be kind of interesting for folks to mull over. That's why it's important, uh, as Mary was saying, uh, to be culturally competent. 
uh, one shop or one approach doesn't fit everybody. When we talk about gay and lesbian suicide, the issues that they're dealing with are very different from white male in the 70s or 80s. Uh, as opposed to African-American suicide. And we see different trends. I mean, when, when you look at African-American suicide, it, you, know, you know, initially, people said African-Americans didn't kill themselves. You know, it was, it was a white people do it. And you hear this in the, in the African-American community all the time. And Dr. Alvin Poussin, who's written a book, uh, actually two books on African-American suicide, gives a scenario of a black man on a hill, and he jumps to his death. And then when they come to investigate, they say, oh, he slipped because you know, he doesn't fit the, the happy-go-lucky image of, of, you know, of who commits suicide in this, you know, in this country. So you, know, you have to be culturally competent in terms of, 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 of suicide. Again, in the African-American community, we saw suicide rates, it would be you know, at a later age than we saw in the white community. I mean, I'm sorry, in a middle age group, as opposed to white suicide, where we saw it as, at an elderly. We saw higher rates among the elderly in the white community, and in the black community, we saw higher rates among middle-aged uh, adults. So it may be moving the, as, a, as a whole. We may be seeing it change to reflect more like what's happening in the African-American community. You're having more, uh, more middle-aged suicides. Also, I, I did mean to say, too, I think somebody mentioned this, uh, I think Molly mentioned this, that years ago, the the uh, in the African American community, uh, you had uh, undertakers filling out the death certificates for African Americans, and if the insurance companies didn't pay, you know, were you going to get suicides? It's not going to be a suicide because one, you have that stigma of suicide, um, as well as if the undertaker is not going to get paid, he's not going to put it was a suicide down there. So again, the data doesn't really show the extent. It's a tip of the iceberg, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of suicidal behavior. Uh, there's something also called victim-precipitated homicides. And that's when it was, it was traditionally called suicide by cop, where someone pulls a gun on a cop, and, the, and there's no bullets in the, in the gun. You know, they wanted to die, but they wanted to go out. And you, they wanted to go out, someone else to kill them. And you may hear a lot of gang members, and you hear it in Tupac's song and Biggie Smalls' songs, you know, about how they want to die, and then all of a sudden they're dead. Or you talk to a family with a, where their child has uh, completed suicide, and um, they, they say, well, he said something big was going to happen, you know, and then he goes into a, another gang's territory intentionally, and then so he's shot and killed. So it, it wouldn't show up necessarily in the, in the suicide statistics, um, as you'll see with car accidents. And then when you look, there, would, there were no skid marks, meaning they didn't hit the brakes. It may not be considered a suicide, but it is. Drug overdose, as Mary mentioned it earlier, where some people will continue to tease at death by taking more and more of the drug. They know the amount will get them high, but they'll tease at death by taking more and more drugs. Yes, I think we have another question. Um, I know most of your talk was about um, youth violence, but I am fascinated about that middle age, um, and that's a new thing with the trend. Are the, is there research being done with that? Because sometimes I think, especially in suicide, because like you said, it's such a newer field with the research, is we catch it later. You know, sort of after the fact, are there people studying that age range into why some, what are some of the risk factors with that related as well? Okay, since I mentioned it, I should go get to me. Oh, well, no, well, you know, I, 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 it's, it's very new research. The data just came out, what was it, last week? Or was it last week? Yeah, the data just came out last week, so people haven't been able to really look at the data much. Um, you know, there's a speculation on my part that because of the economy, uh, a lot of these people are losing their jobs or can't find jobs. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, uh, more and more middle-aged uh, suicides. And, and I think um, I think it's great that you are interested in that age. I think hopefully people can hear me. Okay, um, youth get a lot of attention. Um, and, and rightly so, but also there's other groups that are getting ignored. So as you can see, you know, the overall numbers in youth are small, but their rates end up being high, um, you know, too. And there, it ends up being a high cause of death because they don't die by a lot of other things. And for us to you, to lose a young life by their own hands, there's just something emotional, you know, about that that, ca that captures a lot of... Uh, clinicians and researchers' attention and federal dollars. Um, but And there's been other populations, you know, veterans now are becoming a big 
focus out there in the research world. But there has been talk that kind of the middle age and elderly, there is research done with those groups, but maybe not historically as much as some of these other groups. So I think if you're interested in that, I think that would be fabulous. But like you said, different things. You know, at that age, a lot of it um, is around economic kinds of things. So you'll hear, and again, it's hard to generalize, but you will hear, you know, about people losing their jobs, losing a lot of money in, you know, gambling or in the stock market. A lot of it's related to kind of position or status and job, or, you know, maybe they had a breakup of a marriage or, or something like that. So you, or um, depending on how old they are, if they're having medical issues, we start to see a little bit more of that. That's definitely in the elderly, but you can start to see that in some middle-aged um, people as well, you know, coming up with chronic medical conditions or chronic pain, um, you can kind of see that those might be issues that might be a little more specific kind of to that, that population. So I don't know if you have a follow-up thought. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're welcome. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. You have to play Oprah and run. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for your talk today. Um, I have a question about the graph that you showed that showed the use of firearms declining while um, hanging and asphyxiation were increasing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is an argument against means restriction as an effective um, tool? No. But the reason why I say that is because there are still people dying by those methods. Um, and suicide, as, as, many, as many sort of mental health um, problems, is very sort of complicated. So I think means restriction is still a good approach. But should it be our only pro approach or should it be our primary approach? No, because this is going to miss a whole group of people who are um, using other methods. Um, but I do think it is still a valuable approach. And so, for instance, even if just if you think, I, you know, we might have some clinicians at home kind of or at their office watching this, you know, when you think of who you deal with in your everyday life, you know, if you're a clinician, you might see a kid who's at high risk for suicide because maybe they made a previous attempt, they show up in the emergency department. You know, for that person, it would still be really important to talk to that youth and that uh, parent or whoever is their um, adult caretaker about means restriction in their home. Um, so it's a different kind of means restriction. Restriction might not be like you know let's ban guns all across the country or put barriers on bridges, but even just on a one-on-one -on -one basis, there is some evidence that talking with youth and parents about restricting means for for youth who've made suicide attempts is really important because that doesn't. To be frank, I mean, I've worked with some youth who have attempted suicide. Parents don't necessarily think about that and don't always get educated. And that doesn't cross their minds that maybe there's a lot of pills in the house. I should take them out of the house or I should put them away or I should give my youth her pills as opposed to giving her control over this or we do have this gun in the house. So I think on an individual level, it's still a very powerful approach. Um, and, and, and the data is different in different countries and different places. So in certain countries in the world, you know, other methods are more prevalent where means restriction might be important. So it's just, I think, again, it's one important strategy for certain populations, um, but it's only one tool in our pocket, and we can't sort of rely on it as the as the main method. It's not going to sort of get everyone. Hopefully that answers your question. I don't know if Henry yeah. you have other No, I, I think you're very correct. Um, but we do have to remember that with a gun, it's over 90% lethal if you use a gun, so you're more likely to die from it, um, from the, from the uh, attempt. Uh, that most people who complete suicide in this country still use guns. Uh, and this st one study they did in, in uh, England where they changed the gas that was in the ovens. Uh, it used to be a poisonous gas that they used. If you, you know, inhaled too much of it, you died from it. And people would put their heads in the oven and then cut the oven on. When they changed the mixture so it wasn't poisonous anymore, they found that the suicide rates went way down. Uh, one thing you have to remember also is that uh, in studies that they looked at people who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and lived, they realized that these people really felt as they were going down, they wanted to live. Strangely enough, as they were falling, they, they changed their mind. <laughs> so, you know, so any kind of restriction or barriers you can put in place to kind of stop that, uh, you know, is, can, can, can help. The other thing is that when you look at homicides, and, and most researchers say with the access we have of homicides in this country compared to other countries, is due to firearms. So firearms is an important component of, of a whole mixed bag 
of, of approaches to reduce suicides. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I know that it's been fairly new. The last few years, there's been a real emphasis on anti-bullying in schools at various ages. And there's probably no data, but I wonder if what you think about that as a potential deterrent for um, youth suicide. Yeah, I, I just think anti-bullying, bullying has been going on for a long time. We're, we're paying more attention of, to it. Uh, most suicides are not, youth suicides are not related to bullying. We're hearing more about it. Um, there are usually more things going on um, uh, besides the bullying that, you know, because you have a lot of kids who are bullied. And, and one of the things we're seeing, a lot of gay youth are the ones who are being bullied around their sexuality. And when you realize that you're being bullied in school, maybe around your sexuality, and then you, you, you have questions from God, you know, you, 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 you prayed to God to take this away from you because you didn't want to be gay, and it didn't work, you still have those feelings, you can't talk to your friends, you can't talk to counselors, you can't talk to your teachers, you can't talk to anyone. So that isolation and that pain they feel um, is all part of that as well. So there are many other factors. What I'd like to do is look at suicide risk in terms of, let's say, a, a glass that's, uh, I think, uh, I, I can't remember who used this analogy once, but I thought it was, I think it was Iris Bolton who used this analogy once, which I thought it was a good one. It's a glass full of water, and then you keep pouring water in the water, and the water represents problems, and you keep pouring the water in the glass until it spills over. You know, and you look in the glass and there's all these problems. People only see when the glass spills over. And that's what I see young people in particular. You know, they may have all these other problems. And even if there's a break of a relationship, you'll see young people will blame the girlfriend. If, let's say if a boy uh, breaks up with his girlfriend and she attempts suicide, uh, they will blame, I'm sorry, let's say if the boy committed suicide, they will blame the girlfriend. But they won't see that maybe he had a drug problem and maybe he had all these other issues. Depression is a component of suicide, of course. Um, maybe the, the, they didn't see all these other problems, but they, they only saw that precipitating event. Uh, 